Welcome to GRN, the Growth and Resilience Network, where every episode brings you targeted stories and strategies for your professional and personal growth and resilience. I'm Steve Piscatelli, your host. You know, we've all heard it said that public speaking for many people is feared almost as much as, if not more than, death itself. It's an act of vulnerability, to be sure. You, a microphone, maybe a podium or a stage, and nothing else between you and them, the audience. And it can be absolutely terrifying, and it can be absolutely exhilarating. For many of you, it's somewhere in between. Well, today we're going to explore, we're going to dig down and unwrap one piece of the presentation puzzle, and that is the preparation piece. Perhaps you've heard of the six P's of presentations. Proper preparation prevents pathetically poor presentations. Well, I found in my years of teaching, public speaking, and a little bit of singing, that is preparation. Preparation is not only one ingredient in the powerful presentation sauce. I think it's the ingredient. And to help guide us today in our exploration of presentation preparation is my longtime and very dear friend, Mike Shackelford. Shack, as he's known to his friends and fans, has been an entertainer for more than four decades. Talented songwriter and performer. And... Let it be known that all of us who are presenters are in one way or another performers. And through his career, Shaq has shared the stage with such great acts as the Everly Brothers, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Kenny Loggins, the Beach Boys, Chicago, Hall and Oates, Gary U.S. Bonds, Southside, Johnny and John Hammond. Now, not a bad lineup. And I've had the great pleasure to share the stage with him on more than one occasion, which is Absolutely humbling, I have to say. While his environment might be different from the typical conference, workshop, or even classroom presentation, a stage in a club or an arena, instead of a podium in a conference banquet, he still has to prepare, and that's why he is my guest on today's GRN episode. So, welcome, Shaq. We're glad you're with us. Well, Steve, thank you very much. I am honored with that introduction. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I sound so important. Yeah, well, that, that's quite a lineup of people you've been with. Well, it's been a, it's been a good run uh, for all these years, and I hope it continues for quite some time. If I stay prepared, yeah. <laughs> maybe it will. That's right. Well, listen, I've built this idea of preparation up. Am I overselling it? No. Okay, so... Have you found it, and how have you found it to be an integral part of your performances over these four decades? Well, I'm a nervous Nelly about um, going into battle, if you will. So when I'm when I'm preparing for a gig, let me back up. When I at this point in my career, I have more stationary gigs, house gigs, on a weekly basis. My I just, as a matter of fact, came from setting up for my nighttime gig tonight. That's right. Uh, I don't like, unless it's absolutely necessary for the venue, I never like to set up right before I play. Sometimes you can't avoid that. Uh, I prefer to go get up in the morning, go to work, prepare my gig site the way I, I know it will be, mm -hmm. uh, should be. And then when I get there, it is the way it's supposed to be. And there's no monkey wrench thrown into it. I'm there. I'm ready to play. I'm comfortable. The minute I take my guitar out of the case, tune up. And I'm notoriously uh, an hour at least before the uh, gig time starts. This is my way. Mm -hmm. I go sit down, have a cup of coffee, make sure everything's in, still in place as it was. Um, you know, tune up, do whatever social media I need to do right before the gig. And um, then when I when it's when the ball drops, I'm ready to go, and it's all there. And does that even after all these years, does that help to calm your nerves, whatever nerves you might still have as a performer? Uh, yet, yeah, well, yeah, I think it does because if you walk in and you have to set up and in and around people, let's say I waited until right before the gig time, and I had a traffic issue or I had a flat tire, uh, then I'm I'm there going in and around people in a, a club or a restaurant uh, trying to get set up trying to get ready and my mind is on 
a lot of other things as opposed to performing. Okay. Uh, so I, I never like to, uh, to do that if I don't have to. All right, so those examples are really like the technical piece of what you do, right. the equipment. What about the prep when it comes to your music? You've done the songs, some of those songs for years. Right. Some of your songs you've done over and over again. Is there still a preparation, or is that pretty much autopilot for you right now? Well, it's, there's a preparation involved depending upon the, the venue and the gig itself. If I'm going to go do a private party, uh, a wedding, or a, or let's say uh, just an, a house concert, you know, I will typically think through what do I want to start with, what what kind of volume do I want to begin with, what kind of song, what kind of tempo do I want to start with, depending upon what the the venue is, um, and then I, I sort of think that through well in advance, get there, check the check it out, see how many people are there, see what age they are, try to uh, tailor some of the stuff that I might do to fit that. One thing that I've, that I've done before, especially in a concert situation, when you're up on stage, let's say at the Florida Theater or a festival park, and you can't see very far out into the crowd, I typically try to find somebody right up front that's locked on to me, that knows what I'm doing. When I say knows what I'm doing, they're like smiling, they're engaged with me with eye contact. Mm -hmm. Nodding I'm their head. Nodding their movement. head. And if I have to, if I'm nervous at all, which I don't generally get nervous, I'll get anxious before a gig because it's something out of my normal box routine, uh, one of those type of uh, shows. Mm -hmm. But if I have any anxiety at all, it, it will go away because I'm locked into a person that I know they understand why I'm still doing what I'm still doing. And that, that calms me immediately. Interesting. So part of your preparation is you're anticipating the audience. And it is something that I know with my speaking, I've done a lot of. Years ago, I read an article, and I believe it was Garth Brooks that was quoted in it. And he had said, before every event, no matter the venue, he used to go into the audience where the audience would be sit, sitting. This is before the people came in. And he would sit in different parts of an arena or coliseum just so he could say, this is what this person will be seeing, mm -hmm. so I need to play to that. I was always impressed with that. Well, you know, I've heard that before. I, I, maybe Garth got that uh, from Springsteen because Springsteen is notorious for that. Really? So, And I think Bruce came before Garth. So maybe he – but it could also be – I'm not saying that other people don't do that sure. as well. I mean, it, typically a musician will definitely go out into the house – uh, when they're doing sound checks, somebody in the band or that's uh, a band representative will go out and be able to hear what it sounds like out there. Somebody that the person that's singing will trust to mm -hmm. say, you know, Shaq, it sounds great. You're good. Excellent. And um, so, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Can, um, can somebody over-prepare? I think you can. I think you can, get, I think you can get so wrapped up in the technical aspect of it, like maybe your equipment. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. I, and I, if you don't mind, I was we Please. had we had a big festival here and and at the beach, and um, we were playing at a, at the local club that night. And one of the guest performers, an international star, uh, was going to get up on stage with the band that was playing. Well, the equipment wasn't that great. Uh, his band tried to play, and it was falling apart really quickly. Mm. And the next thing I know. Gary's up on stage, Gary U.S. Bonds. Gary's up on stage singing with the band that the equipment belonged to. And I said to him, I'm really sorry. It doesn't sound good. It's not the way it should be. And he goes, baby, it's just rock and roll. And so <laughs> if you look at it that way, if you get out there and just attack it, regardless of what is going wrong or could be going wrong, if you take the attitude that you can overcome, mm. that's what he did. Yeah, there's something, uh, you know, you've probably heard of the paralysis by analysis. Yes. Where you just said, what could go, go, yeah, I yeah. got to do this, it's got to be perfect. And yeah. perfect becomes the enemy because we're well, never perfect. No. And, and worst case scenario, you know, there's been situations before where the power goes out. Well, you pick up your acoustic guitar and walk out into the crowd and start <laughs> singing a song. It's, it's magic. To it's do magic. that, you have, besides years of experience, you have to also anticipate that. Yeah, you have to be prepared. I mean, I don't, again, you don't want to paralyze yourself. Right. But you have to think it through, like, immediately if something goes wrong. I mean, 
if a fuse that in preparation i would recommend to anybody that's going to go into a public speaking venue or a singing venue or, or whatever make sure that you're prepared for if something goes wrong the power goes out or the projector doesn't work uh you know teleprompter doesn't be prepared so that you, the crowd won't see you panic. If you don't panic, they won't panic. I made the mistake one night of walking off stage to an early in the 1970s, uh, and the guy who helped uh, me and my buddy Kent Lindsay get started in music, I walked off and said, this crowd sucks. And he goes, whoa, wait a minute. Nobody comes to a show, nobody comes to a club wanting to hate the band or hate the music or hate the performer or the, or the mm. uh, speaker. Mm. It's your job to make them like you. Find a way to make them like you. Find a way to make them understand what you're doing. That's and, powerful. Yeah. I mean, it was like, and it meant the world to Kent and I. So what we would do, we would go to every gig we would go to from that point on, on the road, at home, find tables of people, once again, who were engaged with us via eye contact, and go up and introduce ourselves. How are you? Nice. Thank you for being here. It's good to see you. And, and then lifelong friends look at you and i sitting across the microphone from each other right 40 some years later because we did that right that's exactly how you, that's how you build uh that's how you build your gig and i still watch you when um i go to see you perform whether it's at a uh, our atlantic beach uh, community songwriters event uh or in one of the clubs you're, you're always there early mm -hmm. you're always uh walking around with your cup of coffee saying <laughs> hello and then you do the same thing during break Yes. Um, you're, I've never noticed you in the years that I've seen you to ignore the audience, and it's always about the audience. And that's a big thing, I think, with the professionals, the real pros. It's never about you. It's about them. I, they I, came to see you. And your manager, I guess, that's who you were talking about? Well, actually, he was a, uh, the guy that uh, brought Kent and I together. He was a professional musician with the Kingston Trio. And oh. he, you know, he nurtured us along to a certain point. And uh, we learned a great deal from him, and that was one of the most powerful things he ever said. So uh, we, we took that to heart and never really, even in the worst situations, at the worst club you can imagine, we found a way to find somebody. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, worst case scenario, if you can't find anybody out there to hook up with, just play for yourself. If you stay true to what you're doing and believe in the magic that you're creating mm -hmm. and that you're meant to be doing that, that and, and, your, and your soul itself, can say that was spot on right then you know you did the right thing yeah you know maybe everybody doesn't like that song or everybody doesn't like the style of music or the what you're presenting that day but they will respect you for being a pro about it and they will respect you for your passion and your belief that you're doing the correct thing exactly now you're doing a lot with um younger artists now or aspiring artists whether they're young or older but right. new into the business right and so you're mentoring them, and you're mentoring them as songwriters. You're mentoring them as performers. Do you cover what we're talking about now, about preparation before you hit the stage? I am with some of the younger uh, artists who have so much upside. Um, there's some young people that I'm working with that are, I think back to when I was 13, 14 years old, and I'm sitting across in my music room looking at these uh, people playing and singing, and I'm thinking... Oh my Lord! If I if I were able to do that when I was that age, mm. what would what where would I be now? And I'm not complaining about where I am. I'm just saying the knowledge uh, that some of these people have and the avail the technological advancements that have allowed them to understand music and to uh, see more, hear more, be able to interact more than we were able to mm -hmm. do way back in the day. Yeah. Uh, it's phenomenal. And when you see a young person embrace that and learn from it and not be crippled by it, and I think you can be crippled with right. too much technology. Mm. You can just say, uh, I don't have to learn how to tune my guitar by ear. I have a tuner. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to... Gotta be, what if you're without a tuner one day? I was what just going to say, that preparation again. Yeah, what happens right. if your electronic tuner doesn't work? <laughs> right. <laughs> and that brings me to a question. I know in, in teaching over the years and in public speaking, one of the biggest changes has been in the area of technology mm -hmm. and what I'm able to bring to a presentation, whether it's for 10 people or 1,000 people. 
So you just briefly touched on it, but maybe a little bit more specific, and maybe it ties into preparation. Over your years in the business, the music, performing, entertaining, songwriting business, have technological advancements made a change in how you prepare, how you deliver, how you get ready for a program? Or is it still pretty much you strip away all this stuff and it's the same basic stuff? For me, it's the same basic stuff. Now, the the technological advancements have made uh, preparing a little bit easier as in... Uh, you know, my sound system is from <laughs> one part of my career, <laughs> and I haven't changed it over to all the new bells and whistles that everybody else has. I'm thinking so of when you it, mentioned that, some of the old speakers that you'd need like 13 roadies to right. th- carry those, a speaker those, in. <laughs> I now have speakers that are 40 pounds apiece, and there's even more. I have people all the time telling me, Shaq, you got to get rid of those things and get the, you know, the bows or whatever. And it's like, these, these work. They, they, they make me sound like I want to sound. I own them. <laughs> That's right. I own them. They're That's easy pretty to big. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'm going to keep using that. But I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, technology is good. It's a good thing. Embrace it. Uh, but don't be crippled by it. You know, don't forget that. It takes a one person with an acoustic guitar or piano or whatever your instrument is to sit down and play a song. And that's my, if I can boil it all down to that, it, you know, as long as I have my guitar and my voice intact, I can, I can perform wherever it is for however many people it is. I know that I can make that happen. So that's a good thing to lay your head down at night and know. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that you're not dependent on that I'm not technology. Dependent on technology. It helps. It yes. helps. It has, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but if it goes like you said, the fuse goes. Yeah, you got or an acoustic guitar. You know, if you're if you're caught. Now, here's a, a little interesting thing that happened uh, the other day. Out of nowhere, my power cord that plugs into the back of my my uh, mixer stopped working. And we're thinking, oh, it's the outlet. Oh, no, it's, no, it's the cord. And Steve said, no, it's the cord. So I said, what are we going to do? I don't have a backup cord. One of the few things I don't have a backup of. Well, he goes into the office of the restaurant and comes out with a cord. I said, what's that? He goes, it's from an adding machine. I said, will it work? He goes, if it fits, it'll work. So I plugged it in, it fit, it turned on, and it's my new cord now. Yeah. And so now, I have to get a backup. Uh, there you go. <laughs> you got to be prepared. That's, that's, that's wonderful. All right, listen, we're going to bring it to a close, but l- let's do this. And, and you, you started doing that. You, we've talked about a lot. So... For the listeners, can you boil it all down to one thing that our listeners can apply immediately? Now, we've, we've covered a lot. Most will more than likely never sing for their supper <laughs> like you have for the years. So what would you say, what would you want to leave them with that they can use for their presentations to the boss, to a major client, to a church group, or even a, a local city commission meeting when it comes to preparation just one thing that they can start with wrap their heads around know where you're going to start and where you're going to go from the from the very beginning i think we always used uh when we started out we had humor involved i I think a lot of people that speak in public will, will go to something to try to to uh soften the room up a little bit to say something funny something about the locale where you are uh, maybe the city you're in or the event that you're speaking So be for. thinking about that before you Be thinking you get about in. that. I think that that's important. To, uh, what can I do to, in, to engage the audience? The quicker you engage them in what you're doing, I think the, the better response you're going to get and, the, and the, the more success you're going to have during that presentation or performance. I love that. I really do. It's powerful. It's simple. It gets back to this idea of the audience, the right. important, the, the people who, who came. Whoever you're going to stand in front of, they're there to be either entertained or informed or to feel better. If you're, at, if you're speaking at a funeral, if you're speaking at a wedding, mm-hmm. what, they're there to, 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 to gain some knowledge Excellent. from you. Yeah. That's powerful. So, folks, let me leave you with a call to action. And as soon as you can, I want you to take a moment. I want you to think about what Shaq has shared with you today. Again, he's in a club. He's in an arena. He's in a coliseum. He's at a festival. 
there are some key takeaways for those of us that are in a conference room or a classroom or a business presentation. So here are three steps for you. I'd like you to do this as soon as possible. Number one, identify that one thing you can do to ratchet up your preparation routine. Get help from a mentor if you need be. And think of what Shaq said at the end of that, which is, what is it? How are you going to open? What's the story you're going to tell? Number two, set a date for when you will start this new ritual. And then number three, the one thing that is the toughest for so many people to do, that is actually do it. Don't kick it down the road. So again, uh, thank you, Shaq, for being with us. We appreciate this. My listeners, I can, I know they're juiced by this. Thanks. And for you folks, if you want more about um, Shaq, go to his website, MikeShackelford.com. And I want to thank you, the listeners, because without you, there's no Growth and Resilience Network. Uh, visit my website for more information about upcoming conversations and about my programs and other resources for your personal growth and resilience. And until we meet again, either virtually online or somewhere in person around this great nation, this is Steve Piscatelli from my world headquarters in Atlantic Beach, Florida, reminding all of us to choose well, live well, and be well. Bye-bye, folks. <laughs>